Hello and welcome to the UNB Law Podcast. My name is Michael Marin and I'm the Dean of Law at UNB. We begin all of our events by recognizing and respectfully acknowledging that the UNB Law community gathers on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional land of Willustaqui. As you can see from our setting, this is a very special episode of the UNB Law Podcast because my guests are two legends of our faculty, Professors Carl Dorr, QC, and Dick Bird, QC. These two men taught at the Faculty of Law for decades and impacted generations of students, including some of our most distinguished graduates. When I meet alumni and ask them about their time at UNB Law, they mention these two men with utmost admiration. So it's an honor for me to welcome them back to UNB Law and to the faculty lounge where they spend so much time as professors for this conversation. So for many of our alumni, professors Dorr and Bird need no introduction, but their credentials and contributions to our faculty and the legal system in New Brunswick and beyond need to be acknowledged. Professors Dorr and Bird graduated from UNB with BBA degrees in 1965 and BCL degrees in 1967. They both pursued graduate studies in the United States, Dick at Columbia University and Carl at Yale. Then they both returned to UNB Law as faculty members in 1968. By their early 30s, uh, both men had been promoted to professor, the highest academic rank. In 1977, Carl left UNB Law to become director of the provincial government's consumer and corporate affairs branch. In 1984, he returned to the faculty of law as dean. During Professor Dora's deanship, the faculty advanced in significant ways with the establishment of a chair in women in the law, the introduction of a French law program, and an exchange with the University of Maine, as well as the construction of the faculty's first computer lab. At that time, UNB Law started being recognized as a top national law school, ranking fourth in the country by Canadian Lawyer Magazine uh, in his last year as dean. And Dean Dorr strengthened the faculty's ties to the local bar, an effort that culminated in a $1 million commitment to UNB Law from the Law Foundation of New Brunswick, and that fund continues to support our faculty to this day. Professor Bird also assumed many significant leadership roles in our faculty during his career, serving as assistant dean, associate dean, and acting dean. Professor Bird was absolutely tireless, teaching continuously for an astonishing 40 years without taking a single sabbatical. In 1981, he was one of only 12 people to be honored with the inaugural UNB Merit Award, and he would go on to receive that award a second time which is a testament to his distinguished career. Uh, Professor Doerr's regular teaching courses included contracts, legislation, sale of goods, and law and society. Professor Bird taught business organizations, corporate finance, taxation, and insurance law. Uh, Professor Doerr retired in 2007, and Professor Bird retired the following year. Professors, thank you so much for joining me on the UNB Law Podcast. This is a real treat. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for having us. We're happy to be here. That's great. Well, we start these conversations talking about life before UNB Law. And so, you know, the, the, the first thing that's distinctive about the two of you is you both grew up in Fredericton, and you seem to sort of follow each other everywhere, from childhood to undergrad to law school, and then your teaching career. So... Did you know each other growing up? And can you tell us a little bit about that? We went to Charlotte Street School together. He joins Charlotte Street School in grade two, and he has a great story to tell you about our introduction. It was a bit of a disaster in that uh, I was the new boy in the class because I joined them after grade one. They, were, they all knew each other, and I was new. Well, uh, come Valentine's Day, somehow I got selected to deliver valentines, and there was this valentine that in very shaky, sprawly hand printing, all one word to Dickie Bird. It was all one word all together, and I looked at it, and I could not figure out for the life of me, well, who is Dickie Bird? I mean, I, I just didn't know. And uh, as, as my wife Shirley told me, it was my first 
major failure in interpretation that I could remember. <laughs> but um, it was, I, I don't think my teacher ever saw me again in the same light after that disaster when she explained to me, Dickie Bird, huh? Dickie, Dickie. <laughs> well, the failure to get that Valentine set my romantic life back. I can by, imagine. By years. <laughs> he, he's never actually recovered. <laughs> So, so, and then were you together in school, like, throughout? Uh, like grade, a, grade two to grade eight. Grade two to grade eight. We were in the same class. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, then we weren't in the same class, I no. think, until high school. In high school, we were grade 12, we were back in the same class. Wow. That, that's, that's amazing. And can you, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your upbringing here in, in Fredericton at the time? Like, what was Fredericton like to... To grow up, you know, in the 40s and early 50s. It was quiet, and uh, you could go anywhere. You were never worried about anything, and your parents gave you a free run of the city. And uh, I played a lot of hockey and baseball, and Carl delivered newspapers. He played, I worked. <laughs> and it's never changed. I, I heard, Carl, that you, you worked, and in, in your dad had like a bike shop or something yes, like Yes, he that. had a sporting goods store, okay. and he had a repair business, both. Okay. And uh, I used to uh, clerk for him at the store. I was never any good at repair. I can't fix anything. And my father used to like to say that Sonny, that was my family nickname. Okay. Sonny wasn't too bright, so I sent him to college. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, that's great. And, and so were you both academically inclined, like, before university, or, or and, and if you were, like, what, what do you think you attribute that to? Uh, I don't think I was as academically inclined. Uh, I had, I, we both took business as an undergraduate, yeah. and uh, we ended up in marketing. Uh, we had to create teams, and we were on the same team, and that's where I think our friendship really blossomed. Okay. So, so you were working together on a project? Was, it, it, well, it was actually part of the course is that you were, the entire class was broken up into teams. Oh, okay. It was a fascinating experience. Because we had known each other and were friends, but we weren't close friends until the business school. And then okay. we became very close yeah. friends because we worked together on these projects. And uh, we, uh, we liked to challenge each other and so on. But before the business school and in, in grade school. Uh, I came from a family that was uh, did not have much in the way of formal education, so there wasn't a whole lot of, let's say, academic talk in my house. My parents were both very hardworking, both very bright, and they wanted me to do something in life that was good. Uh, and But there was never any discussion about what that might be. The only real problem I ever had with my parents was in grade nine. I guess I lost Dick's influence in grade nine. We were <laughs> separated. And I, anyway, I, I was not a good student in grade nine, and I uh -oh. did what some grade niners do, and I got into all sorts of problems. And I remember in those days, the the school principal was the guidance counselor, and they'd have you in for a half hour to talk about what you're going to do. Well, he looked at what I was doing that year and decided that uh, perhaps the, the best course of action for me would be to enroll in something like industrial program shop or something like that. Okay. Well, whatever I was going to do, I knew that I couldn't do that because I was not handy at anything. Right and I wanted to do something good, something significant. I didn't know what, but uh, uh, it really, I, I worked hard at my academic life, but it, I had no real mission other than to do well, and I, my heart really wasn't into it, so to speak. I did what I had to do because of my parents. I did the best I could do, but I had no idea what really I was going to do. So, so then when did you each decide to study law? Like, Dick, when, when was it something that you knew you wanted to do? Uh, for me, it was actually Carl's decision. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we were having a discussion, and Carl was going to uh, talk to a, a student in the law school about going, 
going to law school. And, okay. uh, and I th he said, think about it. And I did. And what I liked about the idea was that with a business degree, you really need something else to make it work. And uh, you know, whether you're in a, an engineering firm, you're the engineering side, or, or whether you're uh, in some sort of uh, service business, you have to know the service. And I thought, for me, uh, looking at business from the legal side was appealing. Now, we also had the advantage that uh, we could go to law school uh, after our third year, and the end of our first year of law, they'd give us our business degree. Oh yeah, I noticed that yeah. because your your degrees are two yeah. years apart, not yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that meant that uh, there was no real risk about losing a year if you went to law school didn't like it. Well, right. you got your degree yeah. and you were fine. But uh, after first year of law, there was no turning back. Wow. Okay, and and so and where did the idea come for? Well, you? I I began thinking about it in high school. I I I had sort of thought. Uh, law or medicine. The problem with medicine is I didn't like blood. Okay. Uh, and so uh, law seemed to be more appealing in that regard. And then my main concern was that I, of course, not knowing anything about the law, I had this fear that, well, do you have to memorize all these rules? Yeah. Right. And uh, which, of course, as we lawyers know, <laughs> if only there were rules. Yeah, right, <laughs> but, right. But, uh, at that point, I thought, gee, that would be a very boring thing to have to memorize all these rules, right? Yeah. So I was worried about that, but then uh, I uh, did a little bit of research and satisfied myself that it wasn't that bad, so I decided I wanted to, uh, to do that. Wow. And, uh, and Dick and I talked about it, and yeah. we both... Yeah, and I actually went to uh, work in a law firm for the summer oh, okay. to see what it was like. Yeah, yeah. Ended up mostly searching titles, but still, it uh, you know got a feeling for what uh, uh, what the law was all about. Actually, Dick was the one who, was, who taught me how to search a title. And when I started <laughs> articling, yeah. and in those days you could article begin your articling mm -hmm. at the end of first year law. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I started articling, the first job I was given, of course, was to go search this title. They didn't give me a lot of direction, so of course I immediately phoned Dick and said, "Well, how do you do this?" <laughs> <laughs> and he he uh, he showed me. So, uh, you so you you eventually both made it to uh, to UNB Law in 1964, and and I'm I'd like to hear your description of what the place was like back then. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Sure, at uh, uh, you. Registered one day, and you went to class the next. And between registration and the next day's class, an assignment would be posted on the bulletin board. And in many cases, the textbooks or casebooks hadn't, arri uh, hadn't arrived, so you went to the original reports. In our class, there were like uh, nearly 20 of us to start, and uh, we were scrambling for the, uh, for the, uh, to get a report off the shelf. In fact, we ended up, we'd sit in a room with everybody passing the books around to read the cases. Wow. And uh, you were not told what the citation meant, so you'd find some upper-year student to say, look, what does a DLR mean? And, uh, or what is the ERs? And we would head off you to, to read. figure all that out. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, the next day you were in class uh, discussing the, uh, the case. Boy, they threw you right into the fire. Oh, very much so. <laughs> very much so. Now we have orientation and all of these introductory yes, yep. courses. None of that. No. There was wow. None of that at all. And in fact, Dick must remember there were 29 of us starting. To start, yes. Uh, it only probably 20 didn't take long to get to 20. <laughs> That's correct. It didn't. Well, actually, within the first month, we were down to 19. Oh, wow. Yes. It was that sort of environment. And uh, the, uh, the standards were much... Uh, more lenient in those days in yeah. terms of admission than they are today. Right, right, right. Uh, but uh, so we had some students who were who were weak, and, and when they realized how tough things were going to be, they they, they dropped out. But the uh, when Dick says that we had to go to the original reports, actually it it was uh, for most of our courses in first year. 
as it turned out, we had case books so we could actually look at the case in the case book. But for, throughout our, our legal training here, there were courses where uh, there were no case books. You had to actually read the original well, you have reports, to find all the, yeah. go yeah. find them, and, yeah. and, and because they, well, we, as I say, we were down to 19. Well, 19 people looking for the same book is not a good learning <laughs> environment in terms of being able to access the things in the proper Were there order. fights so, over the books? Or no, there were no, fights. no, no, no. Actually, no, no. There, were no. Not, there were some broad hints about, you know, yeah, are, hurry when, up. when do you yeah. think you're going to get finished, but <laughs> yeah. never any di real no, disputes. No. And, and we learned, so you would end up actually doing things in the wrong order. I mean, because yep. you couldn't get the first case in the outline, wow. you'd start yep. with the fifth. It was sort of like yep. they say a director does a movie, they have all these scenes and then they put it all together at the end. Well, that's what we were doing with those mm. sorts of uh, courses. You now, I'm, having I'm curious, with the benefit of a whole career in teaching after this, I mean, do you think that this was by design or just oh. by, like, or was there a logic to, to this way? Yeah, I structure? think it was just a lack of case books. Okay. I think with the, uh, for example, I, uh, agency, I think we had an outline all year. Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't think there was an agency case book, at least that uh, we had a part-time lecture teaching agency and they did a very good job. Uh, but uh, we'd have to go to the original reports. And you learned a lot. You, uh, uh, some cases were very long. They weren't, weren't edited for you. Uh, so that uh, you learn to, uh, to read this to get uh, the still what it was you needed to take from this case. And that was a, a, a good experience. And just to situate people, this, law school was at Somerville House. That's correct. Is that yes. right? Okay, no, so it was not in this building. No, like no, no, it was Somerville yeah. House. Interesting. So yeah. what, what was it like to, to be there? Like, yeah, well, we, we often took the case or the uh, reports up to our classroom, and that's where we passed them around. Okay. Interesting. Somerville House was uh, uh, open most of the time. It, 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 it was supposed to close down at night, yep. but usually it didn't. They left the French door unlocked, and some of the students were very responsible. That we would go in and work there all night long. Wow. And uh, it was great. Yeah. That's fascinating. And, and so, when you guys get together with your classmates, are there any kind of memories that you talk about or stories that you share? Like any kind of fond moments? Well, uh, we had a great time with the uh, Harrison Moot Court. Oh, yeah. And, uh, the dean, this is our third year, and the dean was uh, sick that year. In fact, he was in the hospital for some time and uh, never got the Harrison Court organized. Uh, and he returned, so I'm going to say in late March, uh, maybe early March, but somewhere in March. And uh, uh, he decided, look, we've got to get this new court going. Well, at that time, we wrote exams in April and on the year's work. And uh, we uh, were selected as a team. Part of that time that we were together in marketing, carried right through to law school, we were the moot court team. We were the partners. Okay, in, so you guys were partners in the, in the moot in court, the in the Harrison moot. Okay. okay. And uh, anyway, uh, because it was so late, uh, there was a question whether we had time to prepare factums and uh, put a really good show on. And, uh, Anyway, Carl and I had a discussion about it and said, look, we can afford about three days on this. We can take the weekend and uh, that'll have to be it. And uh, anyway, the other team actually uh, decided they didn't want to argue it at all. And uh, we then issued a challenge to all our classmates, anyone willing to take us on? <laughs> so we won the Harrison by default. <laughs> You know, you don't have to admit that. <laughs> that's a, that's a, too, too I, that's a, so, no, I know. I, 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 but you know, if I start holding back things, it would really come to haunt me after a while. All right, somewhere along the way, it would come to haunt people me. People know. People that's know. right. People that's know. a good story. That's right. Um, 
Well, downstairs, you can find your names. On, uh, oh, with names on the plaque. Oh, yes. And there's no asterisks. Uh, there's no, 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 no asterisks. No by default. Uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, that's, a great, that's a great story. Um, so uh, I, I came across an article that you both wrote, uh, co-authored in 94, about uh, former dean of the law school, William Ryan. And in your article, you kind of break it down into periods of time. So what he was like, you know, as a professor mm-hmm. in your first kind of week of law school, and then when you came back as, uh, as professors. Uh, and you speak very fondly of him in that, that article. Can you tell me a little bit more about the impact that he, he had on you? It was total. Okay. It was, it was total. First year of UMB Law was, in terms of my professional experience, surely was the best thing that ever happened in my life. But uh, in terms of my first year law at UMB was it. It was really, I had found, I knew this was it. I was totally fascinated right from day one. Bill Ryan, Dean Ryan, walked into that room and scowled at us and and, uh, very sternly began the journey, uh, and he really laid it down thick. What, was, what course uh, courses for contracts? Contracts, okay. And he uh, made it very clear: this is a professional school. People will be relying on you. You have an important role to play in their lives, and you have to do your very best. Well, you know what? We got the message. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we got the message. Yeah. And uh, we had total respect and fear for <laughs> Dean Ryan. But there were times that he would actually play the role of an actor and act oh, out yes. the case, which would, oh. it was absolutely fascinating to watch him act. It, uh, it, it would bring the case to life very quickly. How did, so how did he do like well he would, it would uh, he would take a uh, discussion uh, and offer an acceptance of a, some case and he'd play the role of party, party of the first part and party of the second part and he would okay. switch back and forth in the room and say, well you know he either was accepting the offer or wasn't accepting the offer or counter offering or whatever it was but to watch him do it uh, to act out the case was absolutely superb absolutely fascinating and he also would occasionally tell a joke, which went over really well because there was so much tension in the room. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. That it was, a, it was both funny, but it also released all this tension because yeah. he, was not a, he was not a kind yeah. professor. Yeah. He was tough. Yeah. In, in the sense that he would sort of challenge students in, in, oh. in the classroom? Well, he would tell oh. students, uh, one time he told a student, until you've taken more courses from that subject, you better keep your mouth shut. Okay. Uh, actually, it was even more direct than that. He, this, this was a, a student who, was, who worked up the nerve to challenge. This was actually yeah. during our first month, and the student was challenging him on a point, and uh, and uh, you know, this was in the contracts course, and an agency question came up, and the student said, "Well, if I were to know more about the law of agency, I think I could say something more about this." And the dean stopped. Right, he was pacing back and forth. He stopped right up short, and he looked at that student, as only the dean could do, and said, well, that is right, Mr. X, and until you do, I suggest you keep your mouth shut. Wow. Well, <laughs> Mr. X could not open his mouth for a long time. Oh, that's... Uh... It was not good. I mean, we were not, we, we were impressed, but we... We didn't like it. It, it didn't uh, no. encourage you to yeah, no. participate. Um, but it sounds like the um, the impact was really with, with respect to sort of professional values and that kind of thing that he instilled. Yeah. Well, he taught us restitution, and there were uh, it was a seminar course, and there were only five of us in, uh, in the course. Carl, of course, both of us were in the course. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're like the Bobsy twins. Uh, we, we don't go anywhere without each other. <laughs> and, uh, that was, the, the, I think, a, a moment that broke my uh, fear of the law for studying restitution with Dean Ryan. And so uh, we would have to, we had to write three papers and bring the class and defend it. And, uh, 
we learned a lot about restitution. Well, and uh, it was a, a hole in the legal system that some people never fill. But we got our fill of it. Mm-hmm. And it was, good. it was certainly was. Yeah. And so he, he would teach the, the course just with five students. Five yeah. students, yeah. Wow, yeah. What an yeah. 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 In fact, his, and his uh, uh, administrative assistant would uh, bring us coffee in the afternoon and uh, little freak free and cookies that we called restitution cookies. Oh, yeah. We thought we had it. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. is a good deal. Hey, yeah, yeah, it was a good deal. deal. I'm afraid deal. you might be creating yeah. some expectations for. <laughs> You heard that, Mr. Back. Dean, right? <laughs> Constitution <laughs> cookie. Yep. And and the dean himself presented a paper, and oh. we went after him. Oh well. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Yeah. But you that just, must have given you confidence. Oh yes. Oh, yes. oh that's yeah. that Very was a good. So. That was the, I said the defining moment in my legal career, was that at that point uh, I said like we've had a good legal education. We're ready to take the world on. We we knew we had been well trained. Wow. We, yeah. We did. Yeah. Well, and the next thing you did after graduation was graduate school in the U.S. So why did you you, you decide to do that? Well, there were, I felt there were some holes in my education yeah. at law school. There were the courses I thought, look, I, I don't really feel that I've got the, the, uh, the training I wanted. And uh, th- this is a chance to round it out and uh, give me some confidence. And the other thing, coming from a small law school, uh, in New Brunswick, we weren't sure that we were getting the best legal education, but when we went to grad school, we learned we got a very good legal education. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and you were at Columbia. It's Columbia, yes. Dick, so, what was what was that like, and what was it like to be in New York City for for a year? Well, uh, it was a series of events from start to finish. Uh, Martin Luther King's assassinated. Robert Kennedy's assassinated. Uh, the Students for a Democratic Society closed down the university for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was one thing. The Vietnam War was uh, at its height, and everybody was worried about whether or not they were going from law school to the Vietnam. Uh, it was tension after tension. And it, uh, in fact, I remember there was a, a boat in, off Japan called the Peblo. And uh, in New York City, every person who had a transistor radio had it to their ear wondering whether an atomic bomb was going to be dropped on New York City. And uh, you come back to Fredericton and you ask, you know, what was your defining moment of fear in New York City? It was the Pueblo incident. And they look at me, what? What's the Pueblo incident? In New York, that was a a serious matter. What a a time. And how about you, uh, Carl? What was it like at Yale? uh, The reason I... uh, wanted to do graduate school was, was first of all, I was a small town boy, Fredericton. Mm-hmm. I did all of my university in Fredericton, and uh, I, uh, I just wanted to see a bit more of the world. I wanted to you know, get out there and see something outside of Fredericton, and, uh, and I wanted, and I was in, and I was very much into the academic mold at that point. And uh, wanted to, uh, I wanted to get a, an American school. I was actually interested in England, but the uh, it was a two-year program for oh, the Masters okay. in England, and I said no, I just want the one year. So yeah. the uh, immediately looked at the American schools, and uh, and uh, for, I was fortunate to be accepted at Yale, and uh, and Yale was. Uh, for me, a, uh, even though I knew that I had excellent training at UNB, it was it was a big shock. I mean, it was uh, I was out of my element in that. Uh, I looked around my fellow class and figured, well, I know who the stupidest person in this room is. Okay. <laughs> I was extremely worried about that. I even though I had I, and I felt confident about my training, but I, it was me that I didn't feel confident about, but uh, it, it, it settled down. You know, I'd also had just married uh, a month before we went to New Haven, so okay. it was a whole new... There's a lot going on. A lot yeah. going on, <laughs> and uh, and I, I was always a worrier. Uh, the, uh, Dick's always been prodding me about worrying, but I'm, I was always a worrier about things. So it was, for the first semester, I, I must say, I was... Extremely 
worried about things. Yeah. Second semester was great because I realized I could survive and things were okay. We often hear that from from law students starting law school, there's imposter syndrome, you know, and, yes. and feeling like you, you don't belong. Mm -hmm. And it's probably comforting that even you guys, you know, felt mm -hmm. that way. So. Well, I felt that way throughout my career. I mean, <laughs> as a yeah. teacher, um, my first lecture as a teacher, at the bottom of my first page, it says literally, and I, I'm not exaggerating, I had written, turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> and were, you, were you less of a warrior? Uh, well, much less of a warrior. Okay. Yes, much yeah. less. It, uh, in fact, the truth be known, we'd have an examination in undergraduate, and Carl was convinced he had failed it because he got one question slightly askew. Whereas <laughs> I'd look at it and say, that if I only get one question askew, I'm doing well. You're doing really well. No. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, you, I guess you compliment each other. Yeah. Well, we, we, right? did. Yeah. we did. We did. And the other thing he used to joke about was that because he's fast and I'm slow. And uh, so uh, we could say, well, if you have a big problem, uh, maybe Carl's okay, but otherwise see me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Carl, you, you just mentioned that um, you were very much in the academic mold um, when you were uh, going to, to Yale. Um, when did you both decide that you wanted to become law professors like Dick, when did that become something you wanted to do? Uh, I think actually Carl had an influence on that decision. And he yeah. contacted, uh, Dean Ryan was looking for someone to replace Pete Mockler, who had been teaching yeah. uh, here. And uh, so he suggested to me that maybe uh, I should consider at least try it for a couple of years. And uh, anyway, I got the call from Dean Ryan and uh, he said, will you come? And I said, yes, I'll come. Okay. And, right, wow. and it was a quick decision, and it was, it was late in the year. It was, uh, Dean Ryan was actually running for, uh, to be an MP for Parliament, and uh, they were scrambling for teachers. And I thought, with uh, Pete Mockler going to back to practice, I could pick up some of his courses, and it fit my pattern perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. And then how about you? It, it was, well, first, before we get to me, yes. it was my greatest contribution to <laughs> UNB Law School. There you go. There you go. And, there you go. and I don't know why it was so difficult because Dean Ryan thought the world of him. Yeah. And Dean Ryan went out of his way to get him into Columbia yeah. for starters. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And, but, uh, and, and, and Dick uh, had this idea that. He was in New York. He liked New York. He should stay in New York for a while and practice yeah. international yeah. law there, business law. Yeah. And I was suggesting more than once to Bill Ryan because I knew they were still looking. And I said, well, Dick Bird is, you know, mm -hmm. the obvious one. Yeah. But for some reason, and, and Ryan was certainly agreeable to the other, but yeah. for some reason they weren't connecting. So okay. I was suggesting to Dick, you connect. You contact Dean Ryan, and I was suggesting to Dean Ryan, you contact Dick, but nothing was happening, and it was very late. It's a like bash the heads together. To get them together. <laughs> well, and actually, I think part through. of the problem was that Columbia had closed at that point. Yeah, I think this was right. Yes, yes. yes Columbia we, was in a desperate state because yeah, of they, all the they could, Yes, uh, yeah. And, well, the, and I didn't uh, end up wanting to practice in New York because I had to register for the draft. And I thought, oh. I thought that's not going to be a good scenario wow. if I if I apply for a work permit and they decide to draft me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I got them here. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm going to take yeah. full credit okay. for that. Listen, Carl, it doesn't matter how the sausage is made as long as it's made. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, we, we, we don't want to know how it's made. <laughs> that's right. now, now, my interest in teaching, well, I had, I actually developed a, a, an interest uh, I would say probably by the end of the first year of teaching, I began to think, well, you know, being a law professor might not be a bad thing. And I, particularly uh, in a small place like Fredericton, because I thought, well, the type of practice I'd have to go into in Fredericton would be a general practice. And I had done enough title searching in my mm -hmm. article yes. to realize that that really wasn't something I was interested in doing. 
my my wife was uh, totally tied to Franklin because she looked after her, her mother, who was a widow. So I knew that she had to be in Franklin. We weren't married then. We had an eight-year course. But but we knew we were going to get married. And so but I so I knew Fredericton was going to be where I would be. I didn't like the thought of having to do a general legal practice, whereas teaching law would be ideal in that regard. And so I, I nursed that idea for some time. And then uh, in the third year of law, uh, much to my surprise, uh, one day I was called into the dean's office, because he didn't call us in mm. very often. And I wasn't exactly sure why I was being called in. It wouldn't necessarily be good. Hey, you're probably it, having flashbacks to that first year. Uh, I, yes. <laughs> I had flashbacks to the first year, although although we were known quantities by then. But yeah. I had, I, in any event, he, uh, and by that time I'd been accepted to Yale, and, and of course he knew all that because he was one of the people who got me in. He was Jerry LaFoy, Alan Sinclair. Anyway, um, he said to me, uh, uh, well, what are your plans after you graduate? Well, you know, he goes, do your master's. And I said, well, I, I'm not really not sure. And he, as only he could do, said, well, somewhat sternly, he said, well, I think you should teach. And I sort of looked at him, which was coming from him, because in our eyes, he was like, the, the van, right? Mm. And then he said, and I think you should teach here. Well, you see, in those days, the dean, unlike the dean today, had total control. I mean, right. he, he, all he needed was the president's okay, and he could mm. hire a faculty member. It wasn't like there were no committees. Right. It was the dean right. who made the decision. So he was in a position to actually hire someone on the spot. Anyway, he said to me, well, of course, you're a student, so I, I'm not offering you the position, but he said, uh, I want you to come and teach here, and uh, next year uh, you will receive a letter from me late fall offering you a position here, conditional on your completion of your master's degree at Yale. And I said, because this, this was That's quite awesome. That's an great. astounding yeah. thing. Uh, and I sort of like said, well, that would be wonderful. I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I certainly made it clear that I thought that was marvelous. Yeah. And, uh, and that was that. So one of the things, so, so you, get, you both started teaching very young by today's standards. You know, I oh, think yes. you were both 25 years yeah, old or, yeah. or, or thereabouts. And, and so, I mean, it's a different time, but when you returned, uh, you probably weren't much older than some of the, the, the students. Oh, no. yeah. And then you now, your former professors or your colleagues. So what was that like? Frightening. Was it? <laughs> Frightening. It's, uh, first of all, is that uh, the students who were in first year were there when we were in third year. Okay. And the result, in fact, I played on the uh, intramural hockey team, and I knew a good number of them as uh, playing hockey with them, and, and then we socialized with them as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when it came to first day class, uh, I remember clearly looking around, and uh, there was a student in the class who uh, went to Charlotte Street School a year ahead of us. And he and I had played on the high school rugby team together. Okay. So I'm now in the classroom looking, and I'm supposed to educate him. And uh, this was in Schwartz's class. Yeah. And uh, there were a number of problems that year teaching insurance. And one was that the uh, Insurance Act had just been passed. And it was... Uh, a statute at the time had no table of contents, no index. Oh. All right, you did have headings within the, the statute. It was 100 or 357 sections long. And, uh, and I remember this thinking, 
I'm not going to be able to tell these people what insurance is all about. We're going to learn this together. And I made the statement in class to say that uh, uh, I'm bound to make mistakes. And you're going to have to pick them up. And we're going to count. Okay. And uh, when we got, I think, number 10, I think we agreed that we'll keep on the game, but we're not counting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I remember having issued the challenge the students responded to it. And right. uh, I remember one time we were dis- uh, discussing a case and Brian Malone was in the class and he puts up his hand and he says, Sir, I was talking to Mr. Justice Hughes about this case and he said that he had given an opinion when he, this was when he was practicing law, that um, not to appeal it to the Supreme Court of Canada, that it really didn't have a good case, but it should be changed by legislation. And he said he was quite certain there's a provision in the Insurance Act that changed it. And this was a Friday afternoon. And I remember saying to him, well, I think I'm going to have to read this Insurance Act from first section to the last. When I got the section 367, to the heading general, in the next section, reverse the case. <laughs> um, but one, I mean, it's, it's sort of, um, well, it's quite savvy what you did, because rather than sort of pretend that you had all the answers or whatever. I have none. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I, 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 I'm, lear- I'm learning this course yeah. just like you are. Yeah, that's, I think that's the, and, and yeah. I did something similar when I, yeah. When I started teaching, how did you approach that, Carol? Well, we both, we both, I think, learned from observation of one of our professors. Yes. We won't name him, but we learned that the best approach to doing anything in law, and I think it's true in life generally, is that if you don't know it, submit it. Right. Don't bluff it. Uh, and because uh, this, this particular prof had a very bad habit. He was very bright, but uh, he wasn't, uh, he was too bright in some respects. He, he, he sort of tried to get by by the school of his brain as opposed to doing some hard work at times. And we didn't trust anything he said because we just, mm-hmm. we wondered, well, is that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if we knew it was right, we didn't have to know it. And if we didn't know it was right, we didn't. Know it either, but you know, we didn't know it because we didn't know whether, whether he was just bluffing or what. So, right. so, and that was my approach as well. Now, I didn't do what he did explicitly, but I made it very clear because I made uh, mistakes early on and, and continued right up until the last day, I think, making mistakes. But I would always correct mm-hmm. my mistakes. I never tried to. Uh, bluff my way through something. If I didn't know, I'd say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm going to check it, and I'll let you know when I find it out. And that was a good approach. My, uh, uh, my fear of teaching uh, was actually just that I didn't know. I did not know. I knew a lot, I knew that, but there was so much I did not know. That, that was my fear, because we taught the so-called Socratic method. We didn't just go in and lecture, we had discussions, so you, I knew there were going to be all sorts of questions, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, I've got my script and I've got that down cold, and I know what I want to talk about down cold, but the great fear was, but they're going to have questions, and I know so really, so little about mm-hmm. things, how am I going to answer those questions? I don't know if you guys find this, but sometimes the best questions come from people who don't know the subject matter. Um, yes. that, you know, yeah. because they're just, they just, they, they don't know enough to dismiss like a, a question. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's, you it's, know, those yep. can be yep. the toughest yep. ones. They can be. Yeah. They absolutely can be. Now, I had one student. I didn't have the, I didn't have, like I was say, I didn't, even with the, our former schoolmates, you know, as he said, when we were in third year, they were in first year, yeah. so they knew us quite well. I really, that didn't bother me. Um, but I had some new incoming students, first-year students, 
Uh, and one of them was uh, a childhood friend who actually once beat me up. Uh, by, he was taller than I was, so he was able to actually hold me at arm's length. And <laughs> oh, that old trick. <laughs> that old trick. <laughs> yeah. and, and I took quite a, a beating, and I remember that uh, when I came in and laid eyes on him, it was a very awkward moment. Because <laughs> it, was, it was just one of those times when you just weren't expecting that. And uh, Anyway, the, uh, but it never was a problem between us. It, it was like it was a childhood thing. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it, it happened. I had another first year student who, who I overheard telling another student that, well, he used to be our paper boy. <laughs> so there were those sort of social things, that, but, but um, uh, it did not turn out to be a problem in, in any way. It was just in my own mind. I mean, yeah. We worked hard, and Dick and I worked as hard as we could. I think both and, and what was the sort of, what were the relationships like between, you know, faculty and students at the time? Like, you know, were, were, would you ever socialize yeah. with it, students? It, it, were there yeah. parties? Or how did that yeah. It varied uh, between faculty members. Okay. And uh, when we were a student, uh, students at UMB, uh, George McAllister would come to most parties and someone would have to drive him home. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't think Bill, Ry Bill Ryan ever came to one, at least I don't remember that. Uh, so that it varied from faculty member to faculty member. And uh, in the fall, there used to be a law ball, and uh, the faculty and the downtown uh, legal community would attend the law ball. Oh, and so that, okay. uh, and of course, when you think of the size of the school, if you, you had to get some more people to make this thing really yeah, work, yeah. and uh, the uh, the downtown bar was very supportive, so that uh, there was, there was some socialization, and uh, uh, you got to know your faculty member, you know, another side of, of that person. And uh, I went to numerous social events when I was first joined the faculty. Now, um, on another um, episode of the podcast, Lydia Bugden talked about. And this was later in your, your your careers, but there was was there like a variety show or oh, something yes. where people got dressed up and acted something. He, okay, he, I think Dick, you were talked he, about in this. He, he achieved glitter status. What I'm happened? Sure. Okay, uh, Joe Robertson had a niece here at law school, okay. and she and another student decided that they were going to put on a skit at the variety show. And the skit was going to be a takeoff of Swan Lake, and it was called Swamp Lake. Okay. All right. So uh, I was the ugly uh, daughter who was. They tried to marry off to I don't know some prince or whatever. So that uh, we went through this little skit, uh, Swamp Swamp Lake. Uh, where I'm in a tutu and tights, and we all had to wear grab Kodiaks for so just like no, we couldn't dance. So that, uh, and uh, uh, it was very well choreographed. That was a thing that really made it work. And uh, it wasn't our performance on it did at all, but they did a superb job. Of, of You're lucky that. they weren't yeah. cell phones at the time. Well, it's on video. <laughs> it's, it's on. on Video it, somewhere in the library. Where do we get this? It, it, it's, it's, in it's, it's in the library. Yeah. I dug it out. We, Dick, years later, uh, years and years later, Dick and I were in our April Fool's debate once. He, yeah, this was the moot court moot debate. Court. Oh, yeah. Yes. 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 I've heard about that. And we, we were on the side that said that the Martians should not be admitted to law school. Anyway, we had a, a marvelous time that day, a lot of fun. And I... I uh, said to Dick, and I never mentioned this to Dick, of course, but I said, I want to speak loud. So and I, I went and had audiovisual services uh, dig out and, and re redo this thing for me. And, uh, and I played it at the, at the thing. And honest to God, I don't think there's ever been more happiness in that room that uh, move courtroom than there was that day well, when I played yeah. that video. Yeah. Even Dick was happy. <laughs> <laughs> he says that. <laughs> All right, Ed, we got to 
dig that up and uh, put a clip in here <laughs> for the podcast. Well, that I mean that sounds wonderful. Now, um, so and and this is kind of reflecting on on your whole career, but I'm curious. Did you have a teaching philosophy either going into it or did you develop one? Uh, how, how did you think about teaching? Uh, I think we both uh, took Bill Ryan as our model. Okay. And uh, we thought he was a master of the Socratic method. And uh, there was no question that was a major influence in, uh, in my teaching style. And I thought that I learned more in contract law from Bill Ryan than I did in the other courses because of the way he taught it. And I thought, this is, uh, if you can handle this method, it's a great way to get student interest. It's a great way to get them involved. And uh, I found it worked very well to get people thinking. Uh, and do you agree? I agree 100%. I, I find that the, the beauty of the Socratic method, and it's a difficult way to teach because mm -hmm. uh, you get questions that, uh, really don't, you can get off track very easily if you don't watch what you're doing. But I find, found, and we got this from Bill Ryan, is that the, the beauty of it is that it made the student think it was what we call active learning as opposed to passive learning. Right. And mm -hmm. there's nothing like being engaged to learn and remember things. And, uh, you know, I could go, if I were to go into a class and speak for 30 minutes without any discussion of any sort, I'd have the entire class asleep. Right. But with the, with, with the discussion, guided discussion, questions and answers and, and uh, those pointed questions, uh, it, it, uh, they learned a lot more than they would if you could simply if you did all the talking. So, so I'm curious about the mechanics of the Socratic method, like as a, as a professor. So how does, how does it, how did, how did you implement it? Like, would you sort of um, provide any kind of information or, or content, kind of general background, introductory content, and then ask questions? Or was, was the whole lecture or, uh, or the whole class did it revolve around questions, and the purpose of that question was to draw the content out? Like, how, how, how did it actually work? Okay, well, uh, I always started out with my own thoughts on setting the ground work and laying out a general framework, and then moved into uh, a discussion from there. Okay. I never started simply with questions, but... Okay. but uh, the students were expected, and we learned this again in first year law from Dean Ryan. We would spend, or I spent, about three hours before a class preparing for one of his classes. And mm -hmm. you would, that would be three hours of very uh, concentrated thinking and reading and rereading. You, you wouldn't just read a case, and then that meant you would read it and reread it and reread it. And uh, the, uh, so it, it, we expect when we, when we are dealing with the Socratic method that the students have done a lot of work before the class. Not after class, before the class. Right. And uh, you know, so that you just don't go and spoon feed them. Spoon right. feeding is a no-no. Right, right, right. Uh, they are supposed to know quite a lot already about what you're going to talk about. What you're doing is trying to fill in blanks, deal with difficulties that they, you know that they're having from your own experience, really. So and you provide uh, kind of like a general framework, and then you question on the finer points exactly. of the law. Is that, is that how you did it? No, I was somewhat different. I okay. normally started with a student to take the first case on the outline for the day and tell me what happened. Okay. And... Uh, and every once in a while, I would interject with a question and go, now, okay, uh, what's the principle or what's the issue and uh, how was it resolved? And then I usually went to, did the judge get it right? Okay. And, uh, and then we would 
determine how far we could push the case. Sometimes I would throw a hypothetical close to the case to see whether I'd cross the line and uh, the case would apply or wouldn't apply. And, uh, and I pretty much taught almost all my courses that way. Did you, when you were doing that, like, did you have an outline in front of you where you knew kind of where you wanted to get the students to? Like, because like, yeah. I'm curious, like, when, when a professor is using the Socratic method, are you, were you trying to get to somewhere with no, the questions? No, How no, that? no I, I usually have to pretty open. I didn't, uh, for example, I could not teach uh, with a, uh, a PowerPoint uh, because the PowerPoint would tell the class where I want to go right. as opposed to where, where they wanted to take it. And I always wanted to see where they wanted to take it. Uh, and you know, I would sometimes question them, sometimes quite harshly, on, you know, can you go down that road uh, with this case to support that proposition? And uh, it was a fun experience. Dick, Dick was much more Socratic than I was. He, he wanted to see where they wanted to take it. I wanted them to go in my direction. Right. Okay, yep. that's yep. interesting. I want. I want this to is to like I, I'm very, personally. I, I'm very intrigued by the Socratic mm -hmm. method, but I'm also intimidated by it mm -hmm. because um, I mean I, I think my teaching style is a little bit like Carl's, but I think I mean I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would describe it as Socratic, where you know if I'm I'm addressing a, a topic, I'll provide kind of the framework or the overview. And then, and then I sort of ask probing questions. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I've always found daunting about the Socratic method is that if we just, if I just go into questions, I don't think I'm smart enough to keep up with the questions to get the students where, like, I would be, I would be worried that I wouldn't, they wouldn't get the content that they, they needed. That's all, that's that was the part that I like. I, basically, what I'm saying, I think you really have to know your stuff to do mm -hmm. the Socratic method yeah, well. Yeah. Well, yeah, and each, each case often has a, a principle yeah. that uh, comes out of the case that extends somewhere to the gray area. Right. And as I always said, the, class, the cases I like are on the gray area because they're the ones that test the, uh, the principle. And if you can get the right cases, then the discussion uh, can be a lot of fun. So when you were so Dick, when you were preparing like your case book or your yep. materials, you would seek out those kinds. Oh of yes! Work, oh no and, question! Yeah, oh yeah, yes! Yeah. Yes! Yes! Now sometimes you'd have to have a a basic uh, uh, case in order to get you know sort of principles started, but uh, I would seek out the ones that were were on the edge, and uh, you know, and if you look at like I taught corporate law for years, and uh, one of the first cases you dealt with was Solomon Solomon, and. Uh, the question was, you know, whether or not the uh, shareholders, uh, this place had set up this company properly. And uh, uh, he followed all the legal rules. But now, is there any overriding principle that says this case is really, uh, should not be upheld as a, as a proper corporation? And there were judges on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, all the students, of course, are going to see the same. Now, some will look and say, oh, no, I think this judge is right and this judge is wrong, and uh, that's the kind of discussion that is fun to class to say, well, no, why do you think that? Right. Dick has already mentioned this more than once, but I want to emphasize it is that <clears throat> you always come back to the question, was this case rightly decided? You always want mm -hmm. to know, the, you know, what is the rationale? Does that rationale make sense? Because uh, in many ways, that that's sort of a signpost for the future to, as to, well, uh, if it doesn't make sense, chances are, sooner or later, it's going to disappear. Right. Yep. Whether yeah. by a, being overruled or by, in fairly Hughes' case, yep. by legislation. Right. Yep. It's always the, uh, uh, what is it, Lord Cook, three centuries ago, who said the, the reason of the law is the life of the law. Right. right? Yep. It's the reason why. What is the best? What is the best? So it sounds like that's that's really what what you both see as the virtue of the Socratic method. Oh, yes. It gets the students yes. to yeah. focus on the reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the the rules, you know, the rules can, unless the rules are founded on good reasons, the, the rules go. Mm -hmm. When we were in law school, the uh, House of Lords uh, set out a press release that they were no longer going to be considered bound by their precedents. It was big news, mm -hmm. and that was a big change. Well, like all of a sudden now you read a case, you didn't have to distinguish it. 
you can go in and say, look, you got it wrong some time ago. Wow. And you could see the writing on the wall. Yeah. That was coming. Yes. I mean, it, like it was a big thing, but it, like it wasn't, it was shocking in one way, but in another way it wasn't. I mean, right. there's no good reason why a court should follow a previous decision, decision no matter what. I mean, things do change. Right. right. And we have to change yeah. with them. And so by getting students to, you know, kind of um, explain the rationale, try to find it, try to criti yeah. criticize it or you know, pick it apart, that, you know, equips them for, yeah. yeah. Well, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And then the other side of it is that uh, in every one of these cases, someone was on the other side. Right. Right. Law is a fascinating. It's, it's, it's so interesting mm -hmm. because I actually think that most of us, still teach the way you're describing, but for some reason we don't call it the Socratic method. You know, like I think we all do this yeah. in, in, in different ways, but for some reason there's like this kind of um, view that the Socratic method is, is uh, you know, it's like uh, Kingsfield, you know, in, uh, in the yes. paper chase, yes. right? Yeah. And this kind of very intimidating uh, figure. That and was so, Dean Ryan. Okay. And that is Dean yes. Ryan. <laughs> And so I think that's maybe why some professors today, like they don't describe themselves mm -hmm. as, as Socratic teachers, mm -hmm. but you know, in fact, they're talking about the same things that you are, except yeah. they use language like active learning and, mm -hmm. and this yeah. kind of thing. But it's the same thing. Yeah. It, it yeah. is, although I think that Dick, I think it is uh, true to say that Dick was more Socratic and the, he actually uh, was willing to Start out with anything can go. Yeah. That's well, <laughs> he's not a worrier. Because no. he, cause, cause, so yeah. you were never worried no. about where is my class going to go? No. no, no, he's very confident. But that's why. Also, <laughs> I've made some big mistakes in too, so later, than being overconfident. In, in our latter years, I must say that Dick and I would uh, send messages to each other via our students in class. And I yes. would, <laughs> More than one say wow. to a student, ask Professor Bird yeah, yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And then two classes later, I get the answer back from Professor Bird with his question to me. Via the and student. The students <laughs> loved it. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really interesting. Um, now, so I want to throw out a hypothetical here because I think, I think this um, gives us a sense of you know, whether things have changed or not in your kind of approach to these things. So let's say that, uh, and I know there weren't cell phones uh, in the classroom when, when you were teaching, but, but let's say hypothetically you're in class and a student's cell phone goes off and it has a really obnoxious ringtone and it's very distracting. <laughs> how, do you how do you react to that? I would probably make some sarcastic remark and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, uh, I would give the student in question one of my stares. Okay. And uh, they would probably disconnect at that point. <laughs> uh, but there would be one or two, I'm sure, who would who would not. Uh, my students weren't docile by any means. Right. Uh, and in that case, uh, I uh, probably would say, uh, put them on speaker. There you go. Put them on speaker, and we would have a conversation <laughs> with everyone. Mm -hmm. Listening in, and uh, that would not have bothered me yeah. uh, terribly. Uh, but I think it would be uh, much different if I were starting out teaching. Well, you want, if you taught for forty yeah. years, you have a certain confidence and arrogance, I suppose, built up yeah. that you can handle these situations quite easily. But if I were in a first year teaching and the cell phone were to ring. Uh, that would be an awkward, that would be awkward yeah. for me. I'm not so sure it would be for Dick, but it would be. Yeah, I suspect it would be. You know, it, I, the reason I asked the question is because um, uh, I, I witnessed recently a very experienced uh, professor, like both of you, um, who's, who's uh, coming back to the, the classroom, and this happened, right? And um, and he, he dealt with it in... Um, very different way than most of my, we're a very young faculty with a lot of 
turnover in the faculty. You know, I knew professors in the last four or five years, and a lot of us are, you know, 30s, mm -hmm. 40s, early 40s. Um, and um, so so I, he, he invited me to his class, and this happened in, in the class. And I saw how he handled it. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, he turned to his student and said, um, if you need to take that call, you should take it outside. Because, uh, you know, it's very distracting. You know, you're on your mm -hmm. cell phone. I'm trying to teach here, mm -hmm. and like you just can't mm -hmm. concentrate with you doing it. So I think you should take the call outside. Um, and, um, you know, the, the student was like, you know, what? Like, kind of shocked. He's like, no, no, I'm serious. Take the call mm -hmm. outside. And so he says, no, no, I'm sorry. And, and this connect is clearly, like, you know, the way I would handle it is I'd sort of laugh, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of pretend that it didn't bother me. But it actually is rude mm -hmm. and it would bother me. But, you know, kind of our generation is kind of like, ah, ha, ha, cell phone went off, you know, and brush, mm -hmm. brush it aside. But this professor sort of called it out and said, no, that's mm -hmm. not appropriate and whatever. And so I was observing this. And I wonder how this is going to go. You know, this is really mm -hmm. interesting. Well, by the end of that class, that student was eating out of the palm of this professor's hand, just, you know, following his every mm -hmm. word, you know, putting up his hand and yeah. won't, like, just actually yeah. engage, whereas before he was distracted mm -hmm. by the phone and, and, and whatever. So I, I learned something from that, which is sometimes mm -hmm. it's okay mm -hmm. for the professor to say, no, you know, that's not, that's not right. Don't yeah. do that. And it's not because you're mean or anything like that. It's your, mm -hmm. your that's yeah. part of education. Yeah. That's part of part of teaching. So I was just curious how you mm -hmm. guys would, would handle it. It sounds like you would handle it in a similar manner. So. Well, it's, it's not just the professor and that particular student. It's the entire class that's mm -hmm. being disrupted, right? Yeah. And uh, I used to say to my students, which I guess this is getting away from your point, but yeah. I will make it quickly. Sure. The, uh, I used to say to my students that, well, actually, there's more than one teacher in this room. We're all teaching each other, mm -hmm. and you learn just as much, perhaps, from some of your classmates as you're going to learn from me. And uh, you know, they have questions that uh, you should be listening to. They have comments that you should be listening to. Right. And you learn a lot. Now that's that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, my my next question is is. Um, what was the most fulfilling part of being a law professor? What, what, what made you feel the best about your, your job when you would uh, be teaching? And, and what was the most challenging part? What do you think? Yeah. The classroom was what I really enjoyed. Yeah. And uh, uh, I tried to make the classroom uh, like a courtroom experience. And uh, the interchange between students uh, to me was fascinating. And uh, the other part was, as Carol mentioned about we're all there teaching each other, is that uh, when one student would answer a question or go through the Socratic method very well, you could see that they were impressed by how that student handled the matter, mm. and they learned from that student. And, uh, anyway, that was very satisfying. Well, and you could probably see them developing confidence too. Yes, yes. You know, which yep. and then and kind of strength and, yep. and all of that. Yep. So. Yeah, and, and often uh, there were students in the class who did not want to speak up in class, and uh, they were very intimidated by it. And, uh, and I can remember students who, at the end of the class, wanted to get into the the ring every time. Okay. And that, that's satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. How about for you, Carl? Well, the, well. Before I do that, the Dick was so good at putting their students through their faces that in our moot court practices, uh, he would invariably be asked to be the first practice judge for a moot court every year. Okay. And they, they just they realized that he was so good at, at asking them questions and putting them through their stuff. They always wanted Professor Bird is is the one we want to have as our, our judge, which I think is a huge testament yeah. to his teaching ability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? Most fulfilling today? part. Of oh, the teaching. most. Of, <laughs> <laughs> well, t the classroom. Yeah. Well, the classroom yeah. was the most uh, fulfilling part. It was also the scariest part too, though, uh, because I I could be 
very, I, I would have good days and I had bad days. And when I had a bad day, I, I knew I had a bad day. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would come home and I'd be very dejected and I'd say to Shirley, oh, it was just terrible. And she would, as only so Shirley. So worrier again. Yeah, worrier. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Say, yeah. Oh, dear, you would have been wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she talked me into, okay, it must have been, couldn't have been that bad. Uh, yeah. In any event, it, it was, uh, teaching uh, is, is a great thing. It's a great thing, yeah. What about, what about the challenge, most challenging part? I hated marking examinations. I yeah. really hated yeah. marking examinations. The, uh, I was always uh, worried, did I say worried? I was always concerned that um, to maintain my consistency in my grading. So you would, you would uh, uh, set your question, you would figure out how you would answer it as a, put yourself back in the student mode, and then you would read two or three to sort of get a general lay of the land of how they seem to be going, and then you would start marking. And uh, I mark question, not question by question to try to maintain consistency, and then when I finished marking the set, I would test myself by beginning to Remark. Oh God! Uh, and <laughs> and boy, once in a while, not it wasn't it didn't happen a whole lot, but it would once in a while. Every once in a while, you, you would find that well, I'm not being consistent here. Uh, and then you'd have to just start all over again. Mm -hmm. It just drove me crazy. How about you, how about you? Most challenging part, Dick? I would agree. Marking wasn't wasn't fun, but. Uh, Somehow we all seem to manage to get through it. Yeah. And uh, I think Carl's right that uh, uh, you had an expectation when you read the first examination, and when you got to the last one, your expectation had changed in light of what the 40, 50 papers you read in between. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's where the challenge came. And how about um, uh, your, your, your proudest, um, well, what's your most proud of when you look back on, on your teaching? Career, Dick. What do you think? Well, uh, every once in a while, uh, it wasn't formalized in those days, but uh, you would get a, a plaque or something from the, the students of recognizing your contribution, and that was satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Carl? I, I, uh, I think most. Satisfying for me at the time, at least, was uh, uh, we would get student evaluations, and, and I would be very pleasantly surprised by mm -hmm. some of the comments mm -hmm. that would be made. Uh, after teaching was over, my today, I look back, my, 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 I think the greatest satisfaction is just following some of my former students mm -hmm. and seeing how well they've done it. It doesn't make any difference whether they Know, reach the pinnacle of the profession, so to speak, yeah. or whether they're just solid lawyers you know, serving their communities. It, it gives me great satisfaction to think, well, I have a little hand in that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, we did a, I did a podcast with um, one of your former students, Carrie O'Reilly Wilkes, mm -hmm. who uh, I think you both know. And it's interesting because, um, and, and I hope, I think you'll both be very proud of this. Um, she speaks about the two of you like you speak about Bill Ryan. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, wow. Uh, and, and so, so she says that um, the impact that you had on her was basically her, her personal and professional mm -hmm. ethics. That you, you shaped mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. in your class. That's nice to hear. Uh, wow. Beyond you know, mm -hmm. subject matter, yeah. just um, how to deal with other people and your mm -hmm. role as a lawyer mm -hmm. and, um, you know, your, your moral obligation to, mm -hmm. uh, to society, right? Mm -hmm. So, and she attributes that to the yeah. both of you. Yeah. That's nice to well, hear. It doesn't get any better than that. No. Yeah. Um, well, let's shift gears from teaching to Another aspect of your career, which is law reform. So you're both very involved in, in law reform. And I'm interested in this because, um, you know, I think that 
I don't know if, if law professors are less involved in law reform now than in the day. I mean, I don't have any empirical evidence of this, but I did, I did want to um, sort of profile it a little bit because your contributions in, in this regard are both uh, really significant. So, you know, Carl, you were the architect of New Brunswick's Consumer uh, Product uh, Warranty and Liability Act, and, and Dick, you did work that led to the Business Corporations Act in New Brunswick and the Credit Union Act. So, w what is it that appealed to you about about this work? Because you both devoted a lot of time mm -hmm. when you weren't teaching to, to this. Mm -hmm. So, what what is it that was important to you? Well, in in my case, the the consumer protection uh, area was something that engaged my interest right from the very beginning. Uh, there was no course in consumer protection when I was a student, but it would come up uh, in various ways in terms of the unequal bargaining power and taking advantage of people and that sort of thing. So uh, I uh, liked doing that sort of work, and I got the opportunity to uh, do a project for the Justice Department on New Brunswick's consumer protection laws, or lack thereof, and uh, and uh, actually, I appointed Dick Bird as my research director. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a good deal. <laughs> and and uh, so, and, and we we um, had a lot of fun yeah. doing that uh, project, and we used to uh, get together and and uh, of course, I worried a little bit about. Um, we were making out. If we didn't, uh, and but we would we See would sit theme, and the we would get together <laughs> and uh, we would read these pronouncements because it did take a long time, and uh, there would be these questions in the house about how things were going, and the minister of justice would make some grand pronouncement about something is imminent, and Dick and I would be laughing <laughs> in our offices about you know just how imminent this <laughs> yes, would be. Yes, yes. But in any event, it was a great project, and uh, and I was able actually. Uh, when I left UMB by pure luck, I uh, ended up in the Justice Department and was able to implement some of these ideas. And then, when you were um, came back to UMB, I think you you developed like that website that kind of maintained all of yes, the... I did. Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. Uh, I did that on a, on a sabbatical. So just explain to, to folks what it, what it was, uh, the resource that you created. Well, it was just, a, just a, a vanilla website, but at the time it was something we weren't really doing here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dick and I were interested in... in uh, the, the web capabilities yeah. of things, and uh, uh, in any event, uh, I, I thought it would be a good sabbatical project yeah. to try to uh, uh, do a website that, and I did it in three parts, one for real people, as I used to call them, consumers, and one for the business community, and one for the legal community, and, and, and of course, we pitch it a little bit differently to each group. And it was a fairly extensive database that we developed with the cases and all the, that sort of thing. And uh, it, was a, it was a challenge because I, I didn't know anything about it. I went down to the Computing Services Center and took a three-day course on it. And they, of course, not knowing what I was up to, said, well, you know, you go away and you do your thing and then get back to us and we'll see how it how oh, you're making out. Well, they didn't realize that I was going to go away for six months, and then <laughs> I came up with this thing, and it didn't work. It, it, like, all of the links were wrong. I had thousands of links, hyper hyperlinks, I guess you call them. Because you um, had links to the cases. To the and cases all, and yeah, all, all the, the cross-references to sections, and yeah, just yeah. literally thousands. And, and none of them worked when, when we actually put it up. None of them. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and the problem was is that uh, because it didn't work because it was all uh, the, the root directory came back to my computer, oh. and, I, and and uh, so they were aghast when they discovered that well you've got all 
Well, all of these links have to be changed, and I, I had to manually change them. It took me three weeks. You didn't ask the and, dean for a research assistant? Uh, the dean was much tougher than the dean is these days. <laughs> That's a good story. Uh, so, 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 Dick, what appealed to you about uh, law reform? Well, when you were, in that, my case, corporation law, is that uh, you would read these uh, cases and you say, look, this is how the law is being just applied these days, and uh, here was a chance to say, this may be not how we should do it. And uh, maybe there's things missing. Uh, and it was, I think, uh, educationally uh, good to spend some time and uh, ask the question, uh, is this the way the law should be? And uh, I enjoyed immensely the redrafting the Business Corporation Act. Now, by the time I got to do it uh, for New Brunswick, there were lots of models to work on. And uh, so that was, uh, uh, that made the job a lot easier. Do you think it affected your, or influenced your teaching, the fact that you were so oh, engaged? Yes. In oh, the... yes, yes, oh, yes, yes. In fact, in, in the sense, too, that uh, when you were asking a question uh, about a case, you'd say, look, uh, if this isn't changed by the judiciary, it should be changed by legislation. Right. And that kind of thinking applied all the time. I think that uh, that uh, aspect is probably uh, overlooked in a lot of courses because because we're in the common law, we're so focused on the cases. Yes, and people yeah. forget. I mean, it's an obvious thing that they learn in first year, but I think just the structure of our courses and how we're so focused on the cases mm -hmm. that we forget that well, you know, the legislature yeah. can revisit yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, that point's often lost. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. In fact, somebody once said that uh, students are, are long on case law and short on statute law. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. Speaking as a former teacher of legislation, I can yeah. attest to that in yeah. spades. Right. But I think that uh, and I, I, it's probably, I, I have no doubt it's better today than it was in, it was yeah. in our day because in our day, I think we were trained more as a barrister than as a solicitor. We, mm -hmm. because everything was focused on the cases, so you always mm -hmm. saw things in the argumentative mode. That mm -hmm. This has happened. Now what? Mm -hmm. Whereas, really, and that's important, obviously, but really, you also have to uh, concentrate on avoiding the problem in the first place. Right. Know, the, the solicitor's job and. Uh, 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 I, th I, I would hope and I would expect that law schools today are, are much better at drawing in other disciplines. You know, like business, uh, uh, some business savvy goes a long way in yeah. terms of how to mm -hmm. avoid mm -hmm. the, the problem to, be, to begin with. Yeah, we, you know, we often hear that, that feedback from some of our graduates who have who have gone on into business is that, you know, they, they wish that um, as students would focus less on, you know, the disputes and more mm -hmm. about problem solving. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we try to do that in some of our, uh, some of our courses, like we, we have a lot of uh, sort of experiential courses mm -hmm. where the students are engaged in, in this kind of work, uh, yeah. you know, where they're trying mm -hmm. to negotiate, we have a negotiations course, a dispute resolution, Mm -hmm. uh, course, um, we're uh, bringing back a, a corporate transactions course uh, mm -hmm. next uh, next year, mm -hmm. where you know students mm -hmm. will work through a purchase and sale of a business and, and that kind of thing. The real estate transactions mm -hmm. course, which so very kind of practical That's solicitor mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, yeah, practical, but uh, you're focusing on the principles. You're focusing yeah, yeah, on yeah. the skills, how to do these things. Yeah, uh, the trick, of course, is to here, so that uh, you're not just giving information, you're 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 actually teaching a skill. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because if, if 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 the students understand the rationale for things and understand how to approach things, uh, the inf you know the, the the information you can always look up, but you can't look up how to do it easily. Well, no, that's that's those are those are good good points and. Um, in, in our last um, segment, just wanted to ask you um, both 
some advice and, and maybe some general uh, reflections. So, um, you know, UNB Law is, you know, second oldest university-based law school in the Commonwealth. We're very proud of that. It's obviously changed a lot over the years, um, but some things have, have remained constant. So I'm wondering how you both or how you each see the essential character of UNB Law. What, what is that core kind of DNA that hasn't changed despite our long history? Yeah. Uh, from my standpoint, what I really liked about uh, the program when I was teaching here is that uh, it prepared a student to practice law. And you learned a lot of things about the law generally. But uh, I think the nature of our compulsory courses stood our students in good standing when they came to uh, enter practice. And uh, I can know that other uh, universities would be surprised that the uh, concept of law is a compulsory course in my day. Yeah, it still right? is. It's still, and I think that is the kind of thing that uh, makes this school strong. Is that uh, when a student goes out and says, look, I've got the basics that I need to practice law. Not that you have to practice law, you can certainly do lots of other things with it, but I like the idea that uh, you had the basics. And to me, that was the, the strength of the school, and I hope it stays that way. Yeah. What do you think, Carl? I agree. I, I, I think that we should never lose sight of the fact that the Faculty of Law is both a university discipline and a professional school. Mm -hmm. And as a professional school, that means there is an obligation to turn out graduates who are, mm -hmm. if they wish, able to practice law, and you can practice law in many different ways, mm -hmm. uh, in the private mm -hmm. sphere, public sphere, all kinds of other ways as well. But we do need to turn out professional graduates who can practice in the legal profession. That doesn't mean that we're a trade school, so it's not that I'm yeah. against trade schools, but I mean, uh, we were a university discipline, and, and uh, we have to, uh, and I think law properly, the, the best legal systems have always been, one of the strengths of the common law is that it's founded on reason. Mm -hmm. What are the reasons for why mm -hmm. we should decide this case this way? That's that's uh, that's progress in my view. Now, UNB had uh, in the very beginning a huge problem in that they had very few faculty. That meant they couldn't offer very many courses, but it turned out to be actually a strength in the end, in my view, in that because we could not offer many courses, we put a lot of attention into the basic the courses, focus, yeah. the focus. And, and you have your entire life to specialize in this, that, or the other thing, but if you've got the foundation, if you've got a good, strong foundation, which our program has always provided, mm -hmm. you can do anything with it. You can go anywhere and you can do anything. Uh, and and cause you've, got, you've got the big picture. Yeah. And UNB uh, excels in that, has excelled, continues to excel in that, and it's small. It's like it, people feel that they count here right? because they do count mm. here. It's a very people-oriented school. Even, even when we were quite formal, even in the Dean Ryan days when things were extremely formal, still you were, you were part of a group. You didn't feel like, well, there's them and then there's me. You were part of a, a group. And I think that um, UNB is just a wonderful place where people do feel they are part of a group. Yeah, and, those, are, and, those are the two things that I, I hear the most uh, from, from alumni is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the small um, sense, the small, you know, Small number mm -hmm. and uh, and sort of the collegiality amongst the students and, and and the professors and also that 
core curriculum, which uh, mm -hmm. is probably very close today as mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. when you both retired. We have all of those upper mm -hmm. year mandatory courses, including yeah. conflicts, and then we have the compulsory areas of study. I don't know if they were around when, yes. when you yeah. have, but in addition to the mandatory upper year courses, there's also categories of courses. Yeah. The students have yeah. to take yeah. a number of from the yeah. categories. And one of the things we did uh, a couple of years ago is we refined the categories uh, to two. Um, there's still three courses that students have to take. So one is perspectives and theories, which are courses that mm -hmm. are more theoretical. And then the other one is called core competencies. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that has courses that are typically um, that are that are not part of our compulsory curriculum, mm -hmm. but are often uh, tested by uh, the bars mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, the, on the bar exams. Yeah. So anything that's not you know part of the core curriculum already goes into the core competencies. Mm -hmm. and students have to take two of those. So it's still very much this uh, you know structured mm -hmm. yeah. um, curriculum. And you know it, it's funny because I often hear from alumni and they say. When I was in, in law school, I, I hated this being forced to take all of these mm -hmm. classes. I want I was interested in this and that and the other mm -hmm. thing. I couldn't take it. I had to take conflicts. For some reason they pick on conflicts a lot. Anyways, I hear I hear about conflicts. But then after they graduate, they're yeah. so grateful yeah. Yeah. because this came up for yeah. them in their work and they were mm -hmm. well prepared and, and stuff. So I think that that's those two aspects, the the, the, the small size, the you know, and then the the core curriculum uh, are, are, are definitely part of our, mm -hmm. our DNA, yeah. for sure. Um, so uh, this one's a little bit of um, asking you for advice. So uh, we've hired, as I said, uh, many new professors over the last uh, five years. We're looking at hiring 10 more professors likely over the next four years. Uh, so a lot of renewal happening in the, in the faculty. And um, I'm, I'm curious whether you have any advice for us as we go through that process of, of renewal. We struggled with it terribly. Did you? Okay. Yes. I don't think I, it was, we had a major problem in trying to find the right person and the right fit. Okay. Yeah, it was never easy. What do you think, Carl? Uh, I, I agree. Uh, what, 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 what we do want, uh, is uh, and was very hard to find is a, a person who uh, is not only interested in teaching but is flexible at least for a while on what subjects they will mm -hmm. teach. Uh, one of the great uh, difficulties is that uh, uh, many uh, law professors have a particular interest and they're really wedded to that particular thing and it's hard to get them excited about well what about doing this course this year right. and that is a challenge and and uh, it's not because they're not good people it's just because they're they're in some way smart people they realize that uh, well I need to do a lot of research and I don't want to spread myself too thin right. Right. So it, it's it's a conflict between the institutional needs and the personal needs, and that's a very difficult thing. To but you were uh, you were both uh, you know uh, in, had decanal roles and responsibilities. I mean, how how did you each approach those kinds of dilemmas? Yeah, sometimes there wasn't much to choose from. Right. Sometimes you look at the people who wanted to come to Fredericton were few and far between to teach law. Right. And uh, that was a problem. Uh, and we, uh, we battled with it all the time. And it was a major problem. Yeah. You've got to find people who are flexible, uh, adaptable. And, and you, have to, uh, you have to make sure that they like Frederick. Because right. the, 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 the other problem is that to retain them once they're here. You know, they might stay for a fairly short time and then say, well, what I really want to do is be in Toronto or right. yeah. Vancouver yeah. or wherever. And, and if you look at the pattern, it's happened quite often that they get the uh, get broken in here and move elsewhere. Right. Yeah. Because there right. are opportunities 
everywhere. We got to keep them. Yeah, we've been we've been pretty fortunate in there in sort of this last wave of renewal. As I said, it started in 20, 2016, and we've retained pretty much everyone hired at, at that yeah. time. Everyone actually. Excellent. And so, so this next wave, we gotta um, we gotta you know try to match that. So, well, yeah. no. I, I wish we had magic. Yes. I'm looking for that guy. Yes. We, yes. we don't. We don't. <laughs> That's why you get those big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple more questions here. Um, one is that a big challenge that we deal with, both in law schools and in the profession, is that you know students struggle with the demands of law school, and there's lots of. Um, challenges around uh, you know mental health and, and, and this kind of thing uh, you know drug and alcohol abuse and um, you know and as I say you know in all law schools and, and in the legal profession uh, it's it's an issue um, much more visible than it was even when I was in, in law school you know 15 years ago uh, it, it's something that's talked about a lot more that people are, are very concerned about, which I think is a good thing. Um, but what are the solutions to that? Uh, I'm, I'm more, you know, I'm wondering um, if you have any advice for, for either, you know, the law school in that regard or law students or, or, or lawyers, like how do they cope with the stress of the of law school and the profession and, and all that so that they don't, they stay well and they don't go down the path of, Addiction or substance abuse, or anything like that. For me, I think the idea of practicing law or studying law on your own would be a disaster. And it was the support, that, for example, we'd give each other uh, that kept us sane. Uh, I think Bill Ryan once said that anyone that studies law on their own is either a genius or a fool. And uh, I think we'd have been on the side of the fool if we'd tried to. But we would, uh, throughout our law career, we had a small group that, uh, that we met Thursday nights at a pizza uh, parlor. And uh, we'd review uh, one course uh, for the past six weeks. And uh, that kept us sane. And every once in a while, you'd say, look, Lisa, uh, I don't know that area as well as I should. I knew I had to do more work on it, and, uh, but it was that uh, peer support that uh, I think helps to, immensely to get through law school. Hmm. That's, that's great. What, what do you think? I, I agree 100%. Peer, you, you, uh, you look for people of like mind, people that you can uh, talk with and discuss things with, uh, and uh, one of the uh, don't listen, Dick. One of the great things that's happened to me in my life was to meet Dick Bird. Dick I'm Bird, not listening. Dick Bird uh, has set me straight many a time. And in particular, uh, uh, it's already been brought up. I worry. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Dick's always saying, What do you worry about? Yeah. And, and uh, but we actually. Uh, work extremely well together. We complement each other. And if you can find someone that you don't want someone who's exactly like you are, uh, but mm -hmm. someone who's, who has a somewhat similar world, world view, or at least is open mind. You want someone open minded. Right, right. And, and someone you can talk to. If you can find that, uh, that will get you through many a dark night. Because there are dark nights. We all have them. Yeah. Even Dean Merritt, I'm sure. Has oh my goodness! A dark <laughs> yes. No, I, I, absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting that you kind of frame it as peer support because um, this year we actually launched a, a, a student-run peer support mm -hmm. program where they actually try to facilitate this mm -hmm. sort of thing, uh, connecting students with resources to, with mm -hmm. one another. Um, you know, when they start law school, we, we pair them up with an upper year student to kind of show them the ropes. Mm -hmm. And we've also started a, an alumni mentorship program mm -hmm. where we pair them up with, with alumni mm -hmm. as well. It's a way of engaging nice. our alumni yeah, and, uh, and the students. So they get, they get someone, an upper year person, an upper year mm -hmm. 
student when they enter to yeah, kind of show them how mm -hmm. things work. An, an alum right away, maybe to kind of show, hey, you can get through this, I survived, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And sometimes that creates career opportunities for yes. us. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and then when they're, when they're struggling, when those things aren't enough, uh, well, then there's the peer support and then we have the counseling center and, and that kind of thing. But I think your, your point about um, not being alone and seeking mm -hmm. out people is, uh, is, is really yeah. good. You don't have to, you don't have to suffer. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Not. Yeah. Um, okay, so my, my, my last question is, you know, many of your former students who are watching this are going to wonder what you guys are up to these days. What keep, what's been keeping you busy in retirement and stuff? So, so tell us, we'll st start with you, Carl. What, what, what have you been up to since well, you retired? Not a whole lot, I must say. The, the, uh, I have five grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, who I love dearly as every grandparent would. And uh, so I, I try to keep up with them as best I can. The oldest one is actually coming to UNB next year. Oh, okay. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I love photography. I, yeah. I go out and take a thousand pictures and keep one or two. Uh, and uh, I do some reading and just puttering around, but I, I'm not, uh, I'm not a uh, social animal by any means. I uh, keep more, more or less to my Self, particularly in the time of COVID, uh, and uh, basically live, I suppose, a very boring life. But I'm happy uh, and uh, puttering along. Yeah, and you're also pretty active on Facebook. Facebook, I I wasn't going to mention Facebook. Well, I'm, I, I'm doing a plug here. I, you can I, get I, some some friends now, I, some more friends. I, I, mean. I could always use a Facebook. <laughs> I waste way too much time on Facebook, but I do enjoy. And I actually have a number of former students who, who uh, are Facebook yeah, friends, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's wonderful to follow uh, some of what they're up to. Like you'd never know it otherwise. Yeah. And uh, so I, I do get a great enjoyment. And you that. also sometimes share your photography on on Facebook too. Uh, I, I do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's that's really cool. Uh, how about you, Dick? What well, keeps you busy? I, I'm not a big Facebook fan, although no. I do keep track once in a while of what other people have posted. Okay. Uh, okay. Right? Very seldom do I post anything. But uh, with uh, when I retired, I decided I was going to go back and take up curling again. Oh. And uh, with COVID, the restrictions on curling were quite surprising. And the club here was managed to stay open. There was a time that uh, you only could curl uh, against one other team, and you could always had to be on the same team. And there was a period of COVID I was curling six days a week. Wow. All right. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was not lucky. It had, it's, uh, the the you know, team was, uh, we're not in any place, we're not uh, competitive in any way that we're going to win anything, but we have a lot of fun. But it's, yeah, and it just... Gives you something to do every yeah, day. Every day, yep. Yeah. So, so there, there were, now, uh, summertime, it's, you know, it's yard work and the usual thing. And there's, in the past, I did a little traveling after I retired and managed to get to Italy and England and to Ireland. And so that, uh, uh, but with COVID, that all stopped. Yeah. Yep. Well, hopefully, we can get back to some of those yep. things yep. here soon. Uh, I want to thank you both very much for, for doing this. Mm -hmm. This has been a real, for, for me, as I say, I I feel like you, you're you're both characters in the UNB Law podcast because mm -hmm. all of the alumni talk about you in, in, in these episodes, and I hear about you guys from our alumni and all of my visits with them. They talk about you in the most glowing. Well, remember terms. not to believe at all. <laughs> <laughs> They're very convincing, right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. No, this has been um, a real treat. I think um, you know your students are going to love mm -hmm. watching this. And uh, just thank you very much for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. We're, we're happy to be here. And uh, and I'll just uh, wish our, our, our viewers um, uh, many thanks for, for tuning in again. And uh, stay tuned uh, to another episode of the UNB Law Podcast. Uh, featuring uh, amazing people that are part of the UNB Law community.